Hello again. Welcome to Chew Magna. Well, we now have a roadmap for returning to some kind of normal. By midsummer, should everything go according to plan, restrictions on gathering socially will be lifted. It's encouraging to see rates of infection fall as numbers of vaccinations rise. The long, hard road we've been travelling on might be coming to an end. And then what? That's the big question everybody is asking. What's next? I think that might have been the question on the lips of the disciples as they waited in that upper room. Now what? What's next? What will be different now that Jesus has gone back to heaven? Well, they soon discovered that things would change forever when the gift Jesus promised them arrived. The Holy Spirit would make all the difference in the world. A new age begins, a time when God comes in power and dwells within and among his people. Today, Margaret is going to begin a series of sermons on the Holy Spirit. We'll be looking at what the Bible says about who the Spirit is, what the Spirit does, and how we can receive the Spirit and the fruits and the gifts the Spirit brings. John Stott said that what we need is not more learning, not more eloquence, not more persuasion, not more organisation, but more power from the Holy Spirit. Here is John Bishop to read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, huh, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you ever think about the air that you breathe? Did you know that when we breathe, we exhale about half a litre of water every single day? Or did you know that the average person takes around 17,000 breaths a day? We can use our breathing to control anxiety, depression and stress. Our breathing is affected by our emotions. But breathing is something we do all the time. We very rarely think much about it. Just like air, the Holy Spirit is active in our lives as believers. But maybe we don't think much about it. 
It's good that we're beginning a series today that will help us to think more about the part the Holy Spirit plays in our life and help us to consider how we may allow the Holy Spirit to be more active in our daily lives, in the choices we make, how we respond to situations, and in our interactions with people, as well as how we worship and how we spend time with God. In Matthew 3, verse 11, John announces that I baptise you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We know that John is describing Jesus, but he is also pointing to the later coming of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, verses 1 to 4, we read, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This was the fulfilment of an Old Testament prophecy in Joel as quoted later in the chapter. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below blood and fire and billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'll come back to that prophecy later. The Holy Spirit is the third part of the Trinity with Father and Son, the third part of the Godhead, of the very being of God as witnessed right back at the beginning. The Trinity is a difficult concept to get our minds around. Indeed, we can try, as of many scholars, but we have to accept that we are trying to describe God. This is a little like trying to describe the whole of creation by describing a small garden. We will capture something of it, and that which we do capture points to a greater thing, just like we can never fully describe creation. We can never do justice or truly crack the nature of the Trinity. Even understanding the Trinity as three different persons can cause us confusion, and we may find ourselves inadvertently separating God into three separate beings. One of the main accusations of other monotheistic religions towards Christianity is that we actually worship three gods. But we know that isn't true. The Trinity is three personhoods, but not three beings. The Trinity is three expressions of the one God. The Holy Spirit is God, just as Jesus the Son and the Father are God. One being, three persons in perfect, seamless relationship with one another. One being. The Holy Spirit is the expression of God's continuing presence here on earth. Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit in John 15, verse 26. When the Advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. The Holy Spirit is variously described as advocate, comforter, intercessor, helper, spirit of truth, and more. The Holy Spirit is God's power in action in and through his people. But this Holy Spirit doesn't just arrive in the New Testament, The Holy Spirit was present and active in the Old Testament in a foretaste of the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost. I'm going to outline three activities of the Holy Spirit witnessed to in the Old Testament, activities that continue in the New Testament and to this day, as will be explored in upcoming sermons. Firstly, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit empowered. The Holy Spirit gives life. He is present in the creation. In Genesis 1 and verse 1 and 2, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. 
Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The word here translated as spirit, ruach, can also be translated as wind or breath. Later, it is the Spirit who places life, the Son of God, in Mary. It is the Holy Spirit who brings healing and renewal. Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. It is the Holy Spirit who enabled this activity in the life of the psalmist and will enable this in the life of the believer today. The Holy Spirit also empowered people for service. In Exodus chapter 31, we read that a character called Bezalel was filled with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. He used his artistic skills to create the artwork for the tent of meeting. The Holy Spirit empowered Joshua with leadership skills and wisdom. Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. The Holy Spirit empowered the judges to deliver Israel from their oppressors. The great general Barak would not ride into battle without the wise and spirit-filled leader Deborah at his side. When David was anointed king in 1 Samuel 16, the Holy Spirit empowered him from that day forward. The Old Testament also predicts a time when the Holy Spirit will anoint and empower the Messiah. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The Spirit of counsel and of might. The Spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. That's Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 3. The Holy Spirit also revealed in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit revealed God's words to the Old Testament prophets. According to 2 Peter 1 verse 21, the prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God's words were not easy words. They were not often the words that people necessarily wanted to hear. But God equipped the prophets with his words, with his authority, and with the courage required to speak difficult words and to reveal God and his will to his people, where so often they had forgotten. The Holy Spirit revealed God's presence. For example, in Psalm 139, verse 7 to 10, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depth, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. The psalmist could find nowhere to hide from the Spirit, therefore nowhere to hide from God's presence. The Holy Spirit revealed God's path to people. For example, Ezekiel speaks of the Spirit leading him to the gate of the house of the Lord and then later to the valley of dry bones. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit purified. In Genesis 6 verse 3, we read that the Holy Spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal, limiting their earthly lifespan. In Psalm 51, a psalm written by David after he has been challenged over his adultery with Bathsheba, David implores God not to take his Holy Spirit from him. We know from the story of Israel that when the nation was obedient, God was with them through his spirit. But when they fell into bad ways, things went wrong. The spirit or presence of God was no longer working with them, although it was still protecting them and guiding those faithful amongst them. The Holy Spirit brings purity, and it cannot work with evil or where people reject God. But where people are open to the spirit, the spirit is at work bringing transformation to people's lives and to whole communities. 
So back to Joel's prophecy, which is repeated in Acts 2, verses 17 to 21. Where in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit empowered particular people at a particular time, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost will be poured out on all people, no longer limited to leaders and prophets, but to daughters and sons, women and men, old and young. People will be equipped to prophesy, to speak God's words to one another, to reveal God to our neighbours, our friends, our families, our workplaces, our leisure spaces. The Holy Spirit will be revealed through dreams and visions. Again, not just limited to leaders and prophets, but to daughters and sons, women and men, old and young. The prophecy closes with the words, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Holy Spirit's purifying power is open to all, again, to daughters and sons, women and men, old and young. The power of the Holy Spirit is an inclusive power for all those who call upon his name, to all those who see God's revelation. Just as the air we breathe is freely available, this empowering, revealing and purifying Holy Spirit is at work in the lives of believers. The only barrier is ourselves, perhaps our doubts or our fears, perhaps our passivity and low expectations. Let's take time this week to pray for where the Holy Spirit needs to be more active presence in our lives. For where in our lives we need the Holy Spirit's empowerment, the Holy Spirit's revelation, the Holy Spirit's purification. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your three persons, Father God, Jesus the Son of God, and your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you for how we can look back and we can see how your Holy Spirit has worked throughout human history. How you have been there interceding in the lives of the faithful. And Lord, we just pray now that you will show each of us where in our lives we are limiting that power of the Holy Spirit. Where we can be more open to allow the Spirit to work in us and through us. Lord, we pray that you will equip us. Lord, fill us again and again with your Holy Spirit so that we can be equipped to prophesy for you to do your work, to bring healing, to bring transformation. Lord, thank you for the power of your spirit. Thank you, Margaret. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.